Good morning, and welcome to the 576th meeting of the Economic Club of New York in our 113th year. I'm Mike O'Neill, Vice Chair of the Club. The Economic Club of New York is one of the nation's leading nonpartisan forums for discussion on economic, social, and political issues. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, and all those in public positions that help make our lives safer and easier during this time. Thanks, that was scary. Our mission is as important today as ever as we continue to bring people together as a catalyst for conversation and innovation. Particularly during these challenging times, we proudly stand with all communities seeking inclusion and mutual understanding. To put these words into action, the club kicked off its focus on racial equity series, where we have been leveraging our platform to bring together prominent thought leaders to help us explore and better understand the various dimensions of racial inequity and highlight strategies, best practices, and resources that the business community can use to be a force for change. We will be cataloging, publishing, and sharing those insights briefly and, and broadly. We are not doing this work alone, and we'd like to give special thanks to our corporate partners, Bloomberg, MasterCard, PayPal, Taconic Capital, and S&P Global, as well as the many members, speakers, and subject matter experts that are now and will be engaged in this work. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize those of our 316 members of the Centennial Society attending today as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and enable us to offer our programs. A special welcome to members of the Economic Class of New York 2020 Class of Fellows, a select and diverse group of rising next-gen business thought leaders. Please note that applications for the 2021 class are now open. Any member interested in nominating a fellow can visit our website for more details. I'd also like to welcome graduate students from Rutgers University, the Gabelli School of Business at Fordham, and the Medgar Evers School of Business. It's an honor for me now to welcome our special guest today, founder and CEO of Worldwide Technology, David Stewart. Founded in 1990, David and his executive team have built Worldwide Technology from what started as a small logistics transportation audit company into a leading systems integrator and supply chain solutions provider. The company operates in over 4 million square feet of warehousing, distribution and integration space in more than 20 facilities throughout the world. The company employs over 6,000 people globally and generates 13 billion annually in revenue. Under David's leadership, worldwide technology has grown to be the most successful business in the history of the government's 8A disadvantaged business and small business program. The company has successfully partnered with DOD, various security agencies, NIH, and many other civilian agencies. David serves on numerous boards, including Horatio Alger Association of Distinguished Americans, National Academy Foundation, United Way of Greater St. Louis, uh, Concordance Academy, Washington University, Variety, the Children's Charity of St. Louis, the Boy Scouts of America, Greater St. Louis, and many other organizations. The format today will be a conversation which I am fortunate to be doing the honors. We'll end promptly at 1145, and any questions that were sent to the club for members in advance uh, were shared with me. As a reminder, this conversation is on the record as we do have media on the line. So Dave, are you ready for a grilling? Looking forward to it. Thank okay. you for having me. Uh, very, very happy to have you here. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is to start off and learn a little bit more about your, uh, your, your early background uh, and, and then get a sense for how you developed worldwide into what it is today. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll transition over to uh, asking you about your, uh, your personal and business philosophy and, 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 and get a sense for uh, what you think uh, uh, it, it takes for business to really uh, uh, satisfy its, uh, it, its various uh, constituencies. Uh, so let's, let's start with, the, with, with, your, with your background. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, how you uh, spent your, uh, your early days in Missouri, as did I. Tell, tell us a little more about that. You know, my um, background, especially being a person of color, um, uh, coming, uh, growing up in the 50s and 60s and living on the other side, side of the tracks in Clinton, Missouri, uh, is, uh, was a 
an interesting time. Uh, and uh, I was born in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, there's a story all behind that uh, that's very unique. Um, my mother in the, the uh, 40s was not allowed to obviously go to high school. We lived on the other side of the tracks. There was only one school, Lincoln School. And uh, my grandparents wanted her to go to high school and get a high school diploma. And the only way to do that was to, to uh, move to Chicago, Illinois, from Clinton, Missouri, and uh, um, uh, uproot the entire family so she could go to high school. And that's what they did. Uh, they took a risk and were entrepreneurial enough and wanted better for their children as one ended up in Chicago. As a result of that, uh, she met my dad, who is originally from Chicago, and they fell in love. And I was the fifth child born in Chicago. And my mother said, we're not raising our children in Chicago, Illinois. We are, I'm, I'm going back to Clinton, Missouri, and that's where we're going to raise our, 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 our children. And so my dad in tow uh, grew up in this little small town called Clinton you know, on the other side of the tracks. Uh, and uh, growing up, milking cows and I call slopping hogs uh, uh, along the way. And at the same time, you know, uh, I'm reminded of the, the not only humble beginning, but reminded also about uh, uh, the, the first day of school. Uh, the, in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education happened. Uh, and they went on a timetable in 1957. They decided on a timetable of putting uh, a world, uh, the, uh, Clinton uh, integrating the school system. And the Ku Klux Klan said, no way that's gonna happen. Here I am going into the first grade and in the midst of all this turmoil going in, going on in Clinton, Missouri. Uh, I remember my mother telling me the story about, and I do remember this uh, very vividly, my dad patrolled the town all night to ensure that his five children at the time could go to school safely. Uh, it's a memorable moment, moment of sacrifice and commitment to children to ensure their safety uh, during that very turbulent and very difficult and challenging time. Well, that, that is, uh, that, that, that's quite a story. Uh, you know, I could see where someone would, uh, would live through that experience and be, and be rather, uh, rather a chip on, your, uh, on their shoulder, an understandable one. Uh, I read your two books, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. And in one of them, let me, let me, let me quote something here. Uh, it says, the greatest inheritance that I received from my parents is the love of Christ. Therefore, at an early age, I knew that God loved me, that he loved all people, black or white, rich or poor, and that he had a special purpose in life for me. So those, as you described them, uh, indignities that you went through don't, don't seem to have uh, uh, jaundiced you in any way, uh, or certainly not in any, in, in any obvious way. Why is that? I, th I think I had an opportunity, uh, which very few have the opportunity of seeing uh, uh, God's love in action uh, through my parents, my, my mom and dad, and uh, the, the commitment they had made to their children and the sacrifices they were, were making for them to, to have a better life was an a integral part of uh, how it shaped my thinking, uh, the, what, what Christ looks like, as well what his love looks like uh, through, through them and their wonderful example. And they held our, us accountable uh, to that high level as well. You know, grace and truth is kind of a part of a, uh, a mindset that I have in, in that. And as I look at my, my, my parents, I look at those within the community as well, there was an accountability to, to uh, there, was a, there was a strength that was gained from all the injustices, all the challenges, the, from uh, the uh, not being able to go uh, to the movie theater, but to sit in the balcony in the movie theater, uh, to the restaurants we couldn't go to, the swimming pool we couldn't go to, to the to the just basic stuff like the the, the roller rink we could not go to. There were just things you could not do in that town because of the the racial divide and so forth as well. But also, I think it it, it strengthened me around being in forgiveness. Uh, my parents taught me about the power of forgiveness and not allowing people to steal your time and energy and focus away from God's call for your life. And, uh, and they always instilled to us 
that all things are possible and that they instilled in us the ability to be able to to stretch ourselves and, and do it to the best of our abilities. And that was just a part of the, the way we lived, the part of the way we, we, we worked and, and, and hard, hard work was a, a part of how we grew up. You know, my dad set a good example of what that looked like. And every morning we, we, I got up uh, and we had chores to do. And that, part of that was milking cows. So when I talk about milking cows and slockman hogs, uh, it's, a, it's a real story about about uh, hard work. And uh, that was just a part of the responsibilities everybody had uh, as a part of our family. That's interesting. So you went to, uh, uh, to Central Missouri State University. What did you major in there? Uh, business. Uh, I, went to the, um, I went to business, I uh, got BS in, in business administration, emphasis in industrial organization. Yeah, that was, that was a great experience for me. I didn't I didn't realize how poor I was until we, I went to, went to college. <laughs> uh, because everybody on the other side of the tracks were kind of uh, uh, poor and didn't recognize that. But uh, we always had, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, food on the table and a roof over our head and, and uh, the responsibilities of, of, of that. And uh, it was a tremendous experience of getting to know people and developing relationships. The, so many of those relationships are, are solid relationships I've had for a lifetime. And many I played basketball with, many that I, I was a part of, you know, uh, other social, social gatherings and events. And I, I've always emphasized to my, 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 my son and my, my daughter the importance and significance of relationships uh, and how you build those and, and how you're viewed in those relationships as well. Interesting. T take us through. So you get out of school in 1973, uh, and uh, we have a an energy crisis, uh, which leads to a a, a recession. Uh, and you go to work uh, and uh, get laid off. Uh, what happens then? Well, you um, you learn learn about. Um, what are your options at that time to sustain, sustain yourself? Um, you know, there's, 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 there's unemployment insurance, of course, that, that you can always, always, always get in the midst of, of that to sustain you. But also I worked part-time as a substitute teacher in the public school system. And what a great experience to be able to, to share the experience I had growing up and my mother and father teaching us and developing us and be able to share that with inner city kids. And so I have a definitive about the next generation and about developing in that next generation as a result of not only that experience, but many other experiences as well. We have in our ecosystem right now for privately in the Steward, Steward Family Foundation, 100 Steward Scholars. Uh, and all the other programs that I've been involved in have had everything to do with how do we de develop that next generation of, of talent and to the fullest potential of, uh, as well has been a part of how we, we work in sowing seed into their lives and, and, and influence in their lives and, and uh, helping in ways that, uh, that uh, we have the responsibility to. And so I always look at that as eternal return on investment. So every experience has been a, a component of how it's helped mature me and my responsibility and all of our responsibilities in, in community. So you uh, joined uh, the Missouri Pacific Railroad in 1976. Uh, and you are the first person of color uh, in a sales job. Uh, must have done pretty well because in 1979, you joined FedEx. And by 1981, you were the salesman of the year and uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. So give us a sense of how you got, how you, how you made that kind of rapid progress. It was, it was, uh, it was a fun uh, ride. Uh, uh, I think uh, 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 learning about the rail industry. My brother had previously been in the rail as a telegrapher, and uh, he had uh, been there for a, a few years prior to that. He he recommended that I think about uh, a railroad career, and uh, uh, the um, the uh, I I interviewed for the opportunity, and um, they put me in a, 
a pretty extensive program, sales program and so forth as well. So I, I had the opportunity to live in not only in St. Louis, but New Orleans, Milwaukee, Houston, LA, uh, and uh, wonderful client base that I had opportunity to engage and get connected to and so forth as well. And people that I had the opportunity to experience to work with. And then this wonderful company called Federal Express uh, came along and uh, at the very beginning when they had Falcon Jets and and Fred Smith was was the the innovator of its his his time, starting the spoken hub concept with with this company called Federal Express, and um, and the culture that was there was entrepreneurial. Were 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 pushing the envelope regarding possibilities and so forth as well. Uh, uh, Zap Mail was developed there, which is the first fax machines and so forth. Uh, the various drop boxes and so forth. All that stuff. I was a, a, a part of and some innovations I even came up with during that period of time were, were recognized and acknowledged as, as part of the whole system and part of the whole culture that was developed by, by Fred Smith that was, I think, a, a foundation for how I, I think today and very helpful as, as I think even into the future of how significant, important innovation is and you're thinking in that way and pushing the envelope of possibilities. Well, you're salesman of the year, very successful and a very successful company. Uh, and, and you decide uh, that you want to um, go off on your own. What was, what was the reaction of your, of your friends and family to that decision, given that you had been so successful? Well, you know, the interesting thing about it, there was only one voice that really mattered. And that's, uh, I've been married for 44 years. And, and, and that voice would, would have to, to walk, uh, take that walk with me or the walk of faith with me uh, a, a, as well. And uh, she was totally committed, whatever I decided to do and I was called to do, uh, uh, she was gonna be right by my side supporting it. And so with, you know, I had no money, I had two children and mortgage and all those, those things that keep people from, you know, stepping out in faith. And I had a wonderful job and comfort, comfortable job as well, to what made me think that I could uh, uh, go out and buy a company uh, with no experience, uh, real experience and uh, no backing to really support that. And uh, you find a way to be able to do that when you become very innovative, very creative and very open <laughs> to, to options uh, when you get in those situations. So we, I was able to uh, uh, convince a, a relationship and a guy that I knew that owned a, a business. He was 64 years old, looking to retire and looking to get out of, out of his business. And I convinced him to sell me his business for nothing down. And uh, I leveraged um, his business to get a down payment uh, and money from the bank to give him that down payment and to uh, continue with cash flow for for, for, the, for the business to, to, to buy the business. And uh, I, 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 uh, they said uh, 19 uh, later in 87, 88, they said, you know, you did leverage buyout. I said, I did. I said, you know, I, I just, I was just a brother with no money trying to find a way to be able to, to make, this, make this work. And as a result of it, was able to buy this company. It was an uh, uh, audit company and the company was um, actually audited freight bills for, for overcharges assessed by the various carriers. And, and then we expanded that to a, a full service brokerage operation where we're actually moving liquid animal feeds, cottonseed oil and, and orange juice and so forth across the country around the globe using a private and commercial fleet. So we were one of the first ICC licensed property brokers uh, at the time uh, in the country that were, that were doing that. And you, that, that was the, I guess, the, the, the big first step in building what is today WWT, which is a, you know, a, a technology company. You had no background in technology, as I, as, as I understand it, right? So in 1987, I, evolving out of that 1980, 82, 83 experience, uh, a few years later, you know, I was able to uh, uh, transform that company into a different kind of company. I had, had great experience at... Uh, the Missouri Pacific Railroad Company, now the Union Pacific Railroad Company that had merged together. As a result of that, was able to um, uh, convince the executives there. I was finding just as many 
under charges as I was over charges assessed by the various uh, railroads. And I said, you know, well, why can't and why aren't we talking? And I'm just having a conversation with the railroad industry. So I was able to convince at the time the Union Pacific Railroad to do an undercharge audit, which that's something they had never done in the, the 170 years of their existence, uh, unprecedented. Uh, and here I've got one of the largest railroads in the country going to give me all this information uh, for me to do this comprehensive audit of their freight bills for, for undercharges. Uh, and as a result of that, I had to build some sort of system to manage that, that process. So in 1987, we built one of the first land systems in the country. We had 8088 machines, uh, machines on it. Sir, I see that we had a file server that was 660 megabytes. We had a gateway tied to the railroad itself. itself. We had pulled, pulling over the ASCII file over that, uh, that gateway and downloading and converter box and the, the convert it and dump it down to our land system. We used Clipper C++ to develop a software application where we could do the audit 35 to 40 times faster than the railroads could do it themselves. And then back upload it and then cross the gateway, convert it and back across the gateway to loan into their mainframe systems. Uh, it was unprecedented. It's something that they said could never be done. And we had the flexibility and the entrepreneurial spirit in order to get that done. Uh, so we were able to bring on the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Santa Fe Railroad, the Chicago Northwestern Railroad, the Burlington Northern Railroad. We'd had every, every class one railroad west of the Mississippi doing business with us. With that, so was I in the businesses, uh, business of auditing freight bills? Or was I in the business of using technology in a new and innovative way? Uh, at that point, I had the, the pleasure of, of meeting a, a Jim Cavanaugh and some, some other executives at the time that uh, come, come alongside side me and this, this new vision uh, called co company called a Worldwide Technology. And we thought the possibilities would be endless uh, in, in the space, uh, leveraged everything that I had at, at the, the, the Transportation Administrative Services at, 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 the, at the time, uh, set a network up at the same time, began to, to build upon those wa wonderful established relationships that I had built for, for a number of years in, in, in transportation with the companies like uh, McDonnell Douglas, companies like Southwestern Bell, companies like uh, uh, those were pivotal in laying the foundation. And then we were able to spread about by, by engaging in the 8A program, as well as the Small Business Administration granting us with an 8A uh, uh, certification in 1991. As a result of that, we, we graduated years later, but we, were, we have become one of the most successful, the successful a uh, small business, 8A disadvantaged business in the history of the, the program. Look, the, 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 the story is quite incredible and, 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 and uh, you, you tell it uh, very compellingly in, uh, uh, in, in your books. Let me, uh, I, I'm not gonna dwell on, on worldwide, which has been obviously a big success. I now wanna sort of drill down and find out what, what motivates you and what are your business principles here? And what, 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 what do you, what, what do you, truly believe in and what, 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 what gets you motivated every day? You know, so start by reading a quote. Uh, my, my, my faith is extremely important to me. And so that's my guidepost. And so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I am deeply rooted in, into the, 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 the word and there's uh, principles that, and, uh, which, are, which I talk about in the book, uh, doing business by the book, good book, but also leadership by, by the good book as well. Uh, and the, how I build relationships, how I build, uh, uh, relationships with uh, whether it's partners or business associates and what I represent and in, in that as well is a really important it's a servant leadership model where it's uh, you know I, I'm, I'm here to serve and not to be served and and uh, in in the relationship and doing what's in the best interest of others first there's a favorite scripture of mine to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you and so uh, as a result, I seek to to do everything I possibly can to do what's in the best interest, sowing and the best of the, and talent and resources that we kind of in, in improving other people's lives and serving them in ways maybe they 
would would not serve themselves for that matter. And there's a there is a return on investment that doesn't necessarily come by the from the person that you're serving that is pretty significant for me and my life. And there's a joy in that, that and of what I represent in that that I, I think is pretty significant uh, uh, for uh, my ecosystem of relationships, the ministry that, that I'm personally responsible for as well. And I believe to much given, much is required of, of being in, in that regard as well. So I look at everything that I do in the organization I'm involved in as a ministry an opportunity to serve people and support them and, and to uh, model, model what behavior I think is uh, uh, important uh, in their success. And um, I think that um, uh, we've had a great opportunity to be able to do that in, in, in my lifetime. And so at this stage of my life at 69, it's all about eternal return on investment. What can I represent for the next generation in that? that that we're passing on in, in, in God's love and, and, and service and commitment to others uh, and example of, of, of that and, and uh, that my parents were for me that allows that be able to continue through the generations. So we're looking at this company and all the things that we're involved in. Uh, how do we preserve uh, those set of values uh, that every, every, everything to do with the biblical word that I stand and use as our cornerstone, our foundation uh, for my life uh, for a generation to come. Uh, my my uh, wife and I, um, uh, uh, several years ago, we put together a, a love letter to our children as their inheritance. And uh, we think there's nothing more important that we can provide for our children and, and for this community uh, of children uh, that we, we live in and we serve than uh, the, the love that, of, of God that has been shared with us, but the love and inheritances of that to our children to preserve for, for themselves and their families. Thank you for that. Let me, let me read a, 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 a quote from one of your books that basically encapsulates what you just said. Uh, it says, focus on God and his principles for leadership. I'm more concerned with the eternal than the urgent the person than the product, the relationship, not the ROI. And my relationship with him, as well as others, and with what I do with my life I've been given, all comes down to service. Let, let's focus on that service element for a second. You talk about servant leadership. What? Tell, tell, tell us more about that. Well, one, one of the things is, is putting the best interest of others first has been really kind of the part of my mind. What is it, what is, what is it I can do to serve others is really at the, at the forefront of my mind when, I, when I'm thinking about a new relationship or a relationship and, you know, uh, that, that, that expands that in a way of in service uh, to not only to them, but uh, uh, the, the ministry that I, uh, that, uh, I have to represent uh, each, and, and each and every engagement. When I fall short of that, uh, it, it, uh, it, I, 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 I try to do the best I possibly can to improve upon, uh, to, to improve upon that. One of the things that my 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 mother passed away about about five or six months ago, and and she represented uh, 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 God's love to me. And at the end of every day, I I, I, I do an assessment myself, so, uh, uh, and I remember the many sacrifices she made and my dad made, but I also remember how significant the sacrifice that was made on the cross uh, for for me, what that represents to me. And it was personally done for me uh, to, to, to save me. As a result of that, you know, I hold myself accountable to a standard that, um, that, that I'm conscious of every day. Where have I fallen short of serving people in that way and, uh, that, that honors those who went before me who sacrificed so much for me to be in the position I'm in today to, um, to be of service? Uh, to much you give and much required as I, I, I look at things. And uh, that's a top of mind and in each and every, in every engagement, each and every relationship that we have, each and every uh, 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 a family member and friends and community and beyond. That's quite, 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 a, quite a story. Tell, tell me this, you, you also have been very involved in a biblical business training. Written a couple of books on, on, on the topic. Uh, 
how did how did you happen to 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 you know to start that? You know, it was it actually uh, the, there is uh, I only had a little bit to do with that from the standpoint there was a, a guy by the name of Brandon Mann, who if you you see on the book a leadership by the book, who was a co-author of the the book was uh, was uh, he he tells the story better than I do, but uh, I met him some 20, 20 some odd years ago, and uh, he uh, we were mutually interested in and helping a young man who was in business that was uh, challenged in his business and so forth. He was mentoring him. I was mentoring him and so forth as well. And uh, we began, he's, uh, the, the mentee decided that he wanted to bring us together uh, and we ought to know one another. And as a result of that, um, Brandon Mann uh, picked up the phone and, and, and called me and we, we talked about uh, the young man and how we could best help him and so forth. So I'm his 20 year senior. And he says, he tells the story that I, I, I he, his, he has an, had, had an ulterior motive and that was to, to get to know me better so, for, so I could mentor him. So it ended up being we iron sharpened irons. We began to develop this wonderful friendship over, over the last 20 years. And as a result of that, he, he took a leap of faith and started this uh, uh, organization called Biblical Business Training and used my book. Uh, first book, uh, Doing Business by the Good Book, as the first uh, book uh, um, material uh, for and, and launching that that organization. And the intent was to to make uh, uh, make biblical business training a an acceptable practice and opportunity for for leaders in in the business community to take a half hour, uh, forty five minutes every every day to to. Uh, with leaders to talk about uh, those biblical principles and how they apply in business and how they can make a significant difference not only in your life and your family, but also in business that gives gives a, a different kind of outcome. How important is your religious background and beliefs uh, in, in, in WWT? Is this, is this an expectation of all your employees? How, how does that work? No, I mean, it's, 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 we have uh, people from all different faiths that are part of our our, our, our organization. We we are very open to obviously diversity of, of thought and perspective and their faiths and so forth uh, as well. Uh, the principles, the principles of, of, of service and commitment and trust and integrity, all those are everybody agrees upon are significant and important to, to how and the way we live our, our lives. And so we hold people accountable to that uh, and not of, of some specific uh, religious belief or or, or, or faith, and uh, so as as a result of that, as a result of that, I think we've got a a clear understanding about principles and core values that are important to to all of us that we hold one another accountable to. That I think uh, actually rising tides rides all all boats of, of of the organization and how we engage, how we connect to our supplier partners, and how we connect and with our, our, our customers and in the marketplace as well. And as a result of that, I think it makes, there's a clear understanding of our customers and our partners that, that we are a trusted uh, our, our partner in, in a way that maybe others may not be, that gives us a wonderful opportunity to build a relationship with them in ways that others may not be able to. Sounds like you've been doing ESG for quite a long time, it's become it's obviously become a, 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 a topic of great interest today in the investment community. But uh, you were you were way ahead <clears throat> way ahead of the, uh, the the current trend, that's for sure. Well, let me give let me give credit to to uh, Jim Cavanaugh and the leadership team and the the entire organization. That's something that's been emphasized and embedded in our in our leadership for a number of years, and it's the I, I think the centerpiece of how we operate, the, the culture has been developed and uh, as people are onboarded and so forth in the organization, there's a clear understanding about that as well. In the interviewing process, there's something that's vetted uh, heavily and so forth as well. I think uh, there's a reputation of the organization as well that permeates well outside the, the, uh, the parameter of, of worldwide technology that connects to uh, the community and we make, uh, it's an attractive place to be and, and to be a part of and, uh, and it's, it's an exciting place that we're in right now. As a result of that, uh, there is a responsibility we have 
to not only worldwide technology and ecosystem, but also community that we connect to in a unique and very, very special way that I think uh, it permeates out to as well that we've been investing in for many, many years, our time and our treasure and our resources and so forth uh, that I think have, are affecting communities, not only here uh, in the St. Louis community, but across the country and around the globe. Yeah, I note that not only do you have happy clients, uh, you are consistently one of the 100 best companies uh, to work for. Uh, and uh, uh, in looking through the, uh, the, the web, I, I, I noted that many of your employees speak uh, glowingly of the environment uh, in, your, in your firm and, and of your leadership. Uh, uh, that doesn't happen automatically. So your, your efforts, I guess, are, are, are certainly bearing fruit. Uh, you must be very proud. Well, let's say we're, we're very intentional about what we're doing and the whole bit as well. I mean, it's, it's one thing to get uh, uh, accolades from, from those, those great organizations, uh, 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 great places to work and, and, and the other that are not acknowledging us, but to hear it from our employees or hear it from community in general about our reputation, our brand and so forth is a high standard. Now, we don't, we're not infallible. We, we all fall short. We all, uh, in, including me and, and all of us in, in, our, in our lives, but we are co pretty consistent about what we do and what we represent. We think our, our brand and our reputation at risk at, at every turn. And we, um, we, we, try to do, we try to do the right thing. Uh, and um, that obviously is beginning to be recognized and acknowledged in the marketplace. Yeah, for sure. Now you are a private company. Uh, have you ever thought about going public? Uh, we, <laughs> you know, at one time there was a, back in 2000, I think it was a, a 99, 2000 and the dot coms were, were hot and heavy at the time. And we, we went to the marketplace. In fact, that's how I know uh, Stan O'Neill and that group because we did a bake off and we, we looked at uh, carving out a sector of, of worldwide technology, telco com and, and taking it public at the time because we truly had a interesting business proposition uh, in, the, in the telco marketplace. As a result of that, as you know, what happened in 2000, uh, 2000 and uh, the, uh, we have, our, our market cap was a couple of billion dollars at the time and so forth as well. We were uh, several weeks from, from uh, taking it uh, uh, to the public market and the, and the market crashed uh, yeah. in that March. And as a result of that, you know, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, uh, of that, but we had no other inter had entertained no other thoughts of doing that since. We focused on building a good, solid company for our employees, uh, security for our employees. Uh, we would not be able to do the kinds of things we do for our employees and and for uh, a community. I think uh, uh, being being compelled to the public market uh, year over year, quarter to quarter. Uh, assessments to all the regulatory uh, things that uh, you have to adhere to as a result of that. And so uh, we, we, we play for the long term. We play not for, uh, for those short term returns on investment. Uh, the, uh, so we have uh, two, two primary investors and that's significant in relative to the decisions that are made in our board and so forth that's in place and that's independent that allows us to be able to do things that uh, a, a normal company at this size and scale would never have the flexibility to be able to do. Well, it's been a great success story. I tell you, I, I very much enjoyed this conversation. I congratulate you on, on your great success and uh, your, uh, uh, and, and your principles. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for agreeing to this, to, to, you know, to, to appear. Uh, I'm sure our, our, our guests and our members enjoyed the conversation. Well, oh, thank you for having me. You've been a pleasure and it's been a blessing uh, for me to, to get to know you briefly prior to the call. And uh, at the same time, I'm looking forward to having additional conversations with you uh, to learn a little bit more about you. Okay, hope so, that'd be great. Uh, before I sign off, let me do a little uh, uh, housekeeping here. Uh, I'm pleased to report that on December 17th, uh, we're going to host a G G30 report on mainstreaming the transition to a net zero economy with Mark Carney, uh, the uh, UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance, 
and the former governor of the Bank of England. That should be a very, very interesting session, I would think. Uh, uh, we also uh, have signed up <coughs> uh, uh, Chairman Powell uh, in uh, early February uh, to come uh, to talk about the state of the economy. Uh, that should be uh, another uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, conversation. So we've got plenty, plenty of, uh, of things in the pipeline. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we will let you know by email as, as usual. Uh, we've got and An An Andrina uh, Friedman, the president and CEO of NASDAQ, is also on the docket. So uh, we look forward to a, a terrific year. Uh, hopefully that will be uh, a little more flexible than the one that we've just gone through. Thank you all for, for, for joining.